Hello everyone, my name is Chuck. If you've been watching my Let's Plant vlog, then you would know that I've been working on my freestanding pergola. In the last few episodes, I've been filling it up with plants and I would like to show you a bunch of things. One of the things I did was to create a bunch of ledges and fill it up with clumping and trailing plants. When thinking about fillers, we generally think of clumping plants or ground cover plants. And when thinking of clumping and ground cover plants, we generally think of sedums first because that's what most of them is known to do. A lot of them have common names which are just basically a variation of the word stone crop or with the stone crop added in. So yeah, it's no surprise that when thinking of ground cover filler plants, we generally think of sedums. I would do everything I could with them. I would use them in my design, use them for all sorts of things. So in this video, I'm going to show you some ideas of plants that you could use as fillers and ground cover. I have put together a list of around 40 odd plants and that's a lot of things to go through so let's get started. So number one on my list is the Sedum Adolfi. It is known by other names such as the Sedum Nosbomerianum. It is usually yellow, it tends to go orange with enough stress. Right now we are starting to get cold days which is why you are starting to see a shift in color. So this plant tends to grow low and spreads out in the ground making it a very good contrast against all of the greens and blues that we tend to have. It tends to go leggy as it grows especially if it's not getting enough sunlight so make sure to chop off the heads and replant it if you want to maintain the short clumping look. Number two is the Sedum clavatum. This is this blue little growth that you see down here and as you can see it has some nice chubby leaves rounded and it provides a nice contrast in texture compared to the other plants especially when the plants around it have sharper leaf apices such as these. The Sedum clavatum grows and spreads so prolifically that it is great to use as fillers especially if you just want to cover the ground quickly. So. Yeah, it's one of those things that you could use. Also, I'm sitting here just to show you the scale. These things are tiny, but they tend to clump a lot and produce lots of offsets. So they can fill up the spaces rather easily. Number three and four on my list is Sedum Mexicanum and Sedum Rupestre. So Sedum Mexicanum is this lime green that you see right here. It's very bright, fluorescent, and it kind of turns yellow under stress. So usually during the warmer months, during the heat of summer or even during winter or the colder months, you would see that there would be a color shift from lime and the tips will start turning orange or even red like so. We are starting to get cool days now. The Mexicanum is known by a few names. Here in Australia, we call this the gold mound. I think in other areas, in other countries, it would be known as Angelina. So if you see those, then that's the Mexicanum. I like mixing it together with the rupestre because they have a similar texture only the rupestre is more muted, more blue, bluish green and they provide a nice color contrast with each other. So yeah, this is a pairing that I really like and I often use them in my, in my mix arrangements. Next up is the Sedum Reflexum, also known as Blue Spruce. It has a very similar texture as the previous two that I've just shown you. More specifically, the Rupestre Blue Feather. And the only difference between the two is that this has larger and plumper leaves. And you could use this as some sort of transition onto other bigger plants because you would go from thin leaves to thick leaves and finally you could use larger plants. So there's a nice transition in texture if you use those three. And right next to the blue spruce is the Sedum album. It has tiny leaves, rounded leaves in contrast with the previous plants that we've just seen. And you could use the shape of the leaves as a way to contrast between the two. The Sedum album gets its name from the flowers that it produces. They produce lots of flowers in summer, but eventually they dry out and they get very unsightly like this. Removing the flowers when they are dry is quite easy. It's just a matter of pulling out the dry stems, the dry flower stalks. They just pull off easily. So it's not really a problem. So depending on how much you get bothered by the messy look that you see right now, you can just pull them out and replant any broken off stems that you see. These things grow really fast. Next up are three of the more common bean-like plants. You've seen me work on this in a previous episode. So let's have a look. This one is a Sedum Pachyphylum from the name Pachy means large and phylum means leaves. So large leaves compared to this other two here. This one has larger leaves, probably where it got its name. 
it stays mostly lime green or green sometimes turning slightly blue and depending on the light that you get they sometimes turn pale or maybe even just silvery something that they do without fail is to get this bright red or purple tips when they get enough sunlight it creates a nice contrast against the rest of the plant and yeah i think it serves as some sort of a highlight or accent on the plant itself really nice and then there's this too these are different cultivars of sedum rubro tinctum from the name rubro means red and tinctum means dyed so the name kind of means that it is dyed red my plants are getting enough sunlight and stress for them to turn colors the regular rubro tinctum as you can see here is usually just green but as it gets enough sunlight it turns red orange to red even bright red during winter we have just entered autumn here in australia which means that our days are starting to get shorter and the temperatures are starting to go down and this one you see here is the aurora sedum rubro tinctum aurora it is the pale version of the regular rubro tinctum when i say pale it has less chlorophyll compared to this one which is why if you compare the leaves when they are not yet stressed this one tends to be lighter green or very pale green or even quite silvery and once they get enough sunlight and stress they turn pink as opposed to red with the rubro tinctum also if you look closely there's some growth here that are turning bright green these are the reverted version of the aurora they have turned back into the regular rubro tinctum so these things tend to happen and if you don't like it you could just simply detach that plant and plant it as a new one there's a lot of other sedums that you could use as ground cover and honestly if we went through every single type then we would run out of time for this video i think we should move on to crassula so what i have right here is a dwarf form of the crassula pellucida this is the petite bicolor it is a variegated form with tiny leaves and it's mostly just yellow and green although once stressed enough it starts developing pink along the leaf tips and yeah now that we're heading into winter i'm expecting more of the leaves to turn pink as the temperatures drop even further. The next plant I would like to show you is this Crassula arborescent subspecies Angulatifolia, common name Ripple Jade, based on the leaves that you could see. The leaves are wavy or undulating, hence the name. This is actually a shrubby plant, it can get this high. But if you keep them trimmed or take cuttings every year or so and reset them, then you could have them maintained at this type of height. Well, it depends on how you're doing your design. In my case, I like to use them as backing or filling up the back of the garden because these things, they have so much growth and they like to fill up any space that you give them. I'm not sure if you've seen that episode of Let's Plant, but I've only stuck in a few cuttings here last winter and look what we have right now. <laughs> it's, it has completely taken over of this gap right here and I might do this on several other gaps in the garden. Just, just so it's tidy up. Next up is a bunch of Graptosidums. From left to right, we have Graptosidum bronze, Graptosidum Francesco Baldi, and Graptosidum California Sunset. Actually, I'm not sure if I have a California Sunset or a Sidum Pats Pink. They kind of look alike with the exception that the California Sunset tends to have longer leaves and more shrubby or the stems tend to get longer. More leggy, I guess. I don't know. For now, I'm going to treat the two as the same. Although those two are distinct species, different genera even, because one is a Graptosidum, one is a Sidum. Well, in any case, for now, I'm going to consider this a California Sunset. Although now that I think about it, the Sidum Patch Pink is more common in Australia than the California Sunset. So, yeah. But I already said Graptosidum, so let's go with California Sunset for now. So these three are interesting. They have similar growth habits. Well, the main difference you would see is the size and maybe to some extent the color because the Francesco Baldi tends to be more pale and has longer leaves. California Sunset grows bigger, has sharp tip leaves and generally goes taller. While the bronze tends to stay much lower, has smaller leaves, thicker clumps, I guess. Also of the three, I think the Francesco Baldi tends to trail a lot more compared to the others. So that's something you could also use in your hanging baskets, which I might be doing at some point in the future. Well, as for the names, I've already given you the correct names, although the bronze is being sold as Bronze Delight. Also, I think it was being said, sold as Vera Higgins and Paddy Pete, was it? Those are all synonyms, or well, they are the wrong names. The correct name is Graptosidum Bronze. Francesco Baldi, another victim of many names, many aliases. It is being sold as 
Sediveria Starburst, Takiviria Frostbite. Of course, those are both wrong because they are being listed in the wrong genera. This is a Gratosidum. And finally, again, I might be wrong here. This may not actually be a California Sunset. It just might be Sidum Patch Pink. But the problem is I've already chopped it, so I need to let it grow again and see how it goes. That way, I would be able to determine if it is indeed uh, just a plain sedum or a graptosedum. The flowers would also help me as well. There are many other graptosedums that you could use in your designs, but the main thing that you have to think or remember about them is that they tend to trail more than regular graptopetalums, something that they've inherited from their sedum parents. But compared to sedums, they have much larger leaves, which could be used as a strategy or as a way to fill up a large area quicker than otherwise just using sedums, you know? But I'm not saying that Graptopetalums do not trail or they are not tiny. So this one is a Graptopetalum Mendoza. This is a very clumping variety, tiny and tends to be pale, but develops a bit of tinge in its color, maybe uh, moving towards a bit of purple or orange or pink as it gets more stressed, especially during the colder months. And this is the Graptopetalum paraguayense, commonly known as the ghost plant. As you can see, it can get very leggy, but that's one of its defining features because it tends to trail around. There tends to be a little variation in colors. It is mostly just a default, you know, something gray like this one, although it does turn a bit of color, turning towards lilac or even very pale pink during the colder months. That is why it is named ghost plant, so the color. One of the great things about this plant is that it is a very robust grower. Chop off one of the heads, a lot more will grow in its place, much like a hydra. This is why it has been used in many hybrids involving intergeneric crosses, involving graptopetalums. So yeah, a lot of plants are actually based on this one. So if you're ever in a lookout for clumping plants that even trail, then this is one of the things that you should dry out. So like the previous plants, I'm only going to show you a few examples from each genus. I think this video is more of a sampler, just to give you a feel of the types of plants there are. Just to give you a feel of the textures, the colors, the sizes, and the trailing habits, the clumping habits of some of the species in those genus. Now let's move on. We are now in Graptoviria, and I've got, a, I've got a few right here. There are definitely more, but let me just show you a few. For Graptoviria, I would like to show you four plants. The fourth one is actually behind me, planted in the ground. So let's discuss the ones that I have in front first. So the first one right here is Graptoviria crystal. I think this is an Australian hybrid, so I don't know if this is something available in your area or if it might be known under a different name. But in any case, that is the name of that hybrid. It kind of looks like the Superbum. Yes, I say Superbum, not, not Superbum, because I think the Superbum gets its name from the word Superb. So it just makes sense to call it Superbum. But anyway, I think it might be based on a Superbum because it has the same general shape of the leaves, although it is not as flat as the Superbum. This is the crystal as well as this too, although this ones have been hit by fungi and I had to remove some of the leaves, making it look a bit less, a bit less appealing right now. Much like the Paraguayense from the previous batch, these things tend to get leggy, they tend to get longer, and I think it is mainly because they have a tendency to trail and just bend over, you know, just hang out. So. This might be something that you could also use in your hanging basket arrangements. Next up is this Graptoviria Douglas Huff. They tend to grow large, but if you keep them in pots and you know deprive them of enough nutrients, they would get stunted and stay this size. So I have them more or less the same size because they are in tight quarters. But if you leave them in the ground, I'm not sure if I have any planting in the ground right now, or at least I've already removed them. The Douglas Huff is based on the Paraguayense, so it does tend to trail a bit if you give them enough time. But otherwise, they are low growing, they have a very clumping habit. They tend to push out a lot of pups, especially during their growing season, which is usually during the transition months. They do not enjoy the heat as much as Echeverias. They tend to go on the slightly cooler side. I wouldn't say exactly cold, but they do well in autumn, and right now we're entering autumn, so they are in their element now. Hopefully, I would see a lot of growth from them now. By default, during the warmer months, they tend to be pale, more of a grayish 
green like the Paraguayense, but as they get stressed, they turn pink and even orange if given enough light and not enough water. There's a huge range of variation in their color. So this is something that you have to take into account if you have them in arrangement and you're relying on their colors as the point of your contrast. Finally, I have the Graptoviria Moon Glow just to show on the other side of the spectrum where everything is green and blue. Ignore this ones, these are the Echeveria Elegans. They do look quite alike, which is why they are planted together. The Graptoviria Moon Glow, it has thick leaves, chubby leaves, and they are quite rounded. It does not pop as much as the Elegans, but it does push out a lot of pops, so through the years, I've been able to harvest a lot and use them in my landscapes. I have some of them planted in the ground over there. They are mostly bluish green, very farinose, lots of farina. The leaf tips tend to turn, develop a bit of pink or red lining, especially during the colder months. So this gives them that bit of pop just to accentuate their shape and their leaves. And it is something that you could use in your designs. This is the Graptovira Rose Queen. It tends to be brownish gray, bordering towards purple. It gets more purple as it gets more sunlight. I think they are best paired with something green like you see here. So blue, green, and the like. I think it helps the greens pop out and the greens surrounding it makes the purple look more purple. Next up, Sedivirias. So this one is a Sedivirias Letizia. It is mostly green but develops the bright red tips on the leaves, especially when it is stressed. So yeah, something that you see right now. As you can see, it is heavily clumping and given enough time, this would be able to spread out and form a little carpet of green and red. Next up is a Sedeveria Mayalen. It has the same basic leaf shape as the Letizia. I think a way to describe it is the leaves are less chunky compared to the Mayalen. It also has a very strong clumping habit, which makes it a lot easier to use this to cover entire areas compared to the Mayalen. Lastly, we have Sedeveria Hameli. This correction, Hamelii. It grows really fast and it is actually related to the Sidum Pachyphylum. The Sidum Pachyphylum gives it its basic shape, although the Echeveria side of it makes the leaves more pointy. It retains the same growth pattern as the Pachyphylum. And the leaves also resemble the Pachyphylum a lot, except as I said, the leaves are pointier. You could use it as an alternative to the Pachyphylum. Only one other difference between the two is that the colors of this Sedeveria tends to be more on the blue side, while the Pachyphylum tends to be more on the green side. So make sure you keep that in mind. Oh, one more representative of the Sedeveria I would like to point out is this Sedeveria Fanfare. This being mistakenly sold as Graptovira fanfare in some areas here in Australia. If you look closely, the leaves are more slender. It looks a lot like the Hamelii. It has more slender leaves. It is pointy. It is a low growing clump and it produces lots of offsets as you can see right here. So this is another alternative that you could use in place of the previous plants. Next up is Pachyphytum glutinicole. Like many other chubby plants, you could mass plant them. They readily offset anyway. And in the ground, they tend to form very low clumps and they spread quite a bit. So with that in mind, you could also use the Pachyphytum oviferum, which is known as the moonstones. It is more round than this one. The glutinicole tends to have a, a longer leaf and it tends to be more pointy at the end compared to the oviferum. I think I only have one oviferum plant in a pot and it's a tiny one. It's just a cutting. So I don't think I'll be able to show you a clump anytime soon. You could probably do the same with Graptopedalum amethystinum, otherwise known as the lavender pebbles. So as I said, there's a bunch of other chubby plants that you could use, but I don't have them in my garden right now. So yeah. Now moving along, we're looking at one of the intergeneric Pachyphytum hybrids. This is a Graptophytum supreme and it tends to form low clumps. It is based on the Paraguayense as well. And I'm not sure what the Pachyphytum parent is, but it just might be the Pachyphytum glutinicole that I showed you just now. Now we're looking at Pachyverias. These are hybrids between Echeveria and Pachyphytums. This is a Pachyveria bea. It tends to be bluish green for the most part, but it has this very lovely shape and it forms very nice clumps. It would be easy creating a clump of them because they grow quite a lot and you, once you separate the pups, they can grow their own clumps. And right in the middle is the Pachyveria clavifolia. Much like the Bea, it is mostly blue and green. But unlike the Bea, it has rounder leaves which provides a different texture. So if you mix the two, you would see that they would have the same clumping habit, just different shapes. Lastly, this is a Pachyveria powder puff. You might see this under the name Pachyveria exotica sometimes. Unlike the previous two, this one is white, very farinose. 
it is actually a hybrid based on Kante. That is where it gets its white from. So again, you could use this as a contrast in color because it has a drastically different color compared to the others. This guy tends to have a bit of vertical growth to them, but if you give them enough space, they would sprawl around and spread horizontally. Up next are a couple of Aeoniums. Now, Aeoniums are typically stereotyped as this bushy, tall plants, but there are some species and some varieties of Aeoniums that tend to just sprawl horizontally and form a nice carpet. These are just two of them, but there are a few more. So on your right, this is an Aeonium emerald carpet, and it says so in the name itself. It's a carpet, so it forms a carpet-like structure if you give them enough space. And right now, I just have a single plant, although it has lots of offsets. But it's starting to get cold here, so it should be about time for me to chop off this offset soon and let them grow their own roots and eventually they will form their own offsets. Unlike the other ground cover that I've shown you so far, the emerald carpet is suited for very large areas because these things, when they sprawl, they tend to take up a lot of space. Although they do a good, they do a good job of covering up the space in between. In this case, there's some gaps because I've removed all of the dead leaves now. So yeah, it looks a bit bare in between. Now on your left, this is the variegated version of the Aeonium Haworthii. I used to have some of the regular Haworthii, but we have probably thrown it out already because I only see the variegated ones here. But that's not really a worry because these things, they sometimes tend to revert to the regular version. So yeah, it's only a matter of time before I have those again. This is an Aeonium Haworthii Dream Color. That's the correct name. Although it has been popularly known as Aeonium Kiwi or sometimes even Tricolor. That last name is given because it has three colors. As you can see, it is green, yellow, and pink. The pink is mainly on the margins and the yellow is somewhere in between the two. They form very thick clumps and they just tend to sprawl horizontally very low. And for that reason, I like using them as the edges of a garden bed because, you know, they form this nice grade, this nice slope, and they do not just spout up abruptly. So very nice transition to a garden bed. Another plant I'd like to show you is this Fidimus purius. There are several varieties of this. The most popular one, I think, is the Dragon's Blood. You could also see them as Jamaican Sunset and Voodoo. I think the differences between those cultivars is mainly the size of the rosette and I guess the color. In this case, I have this under the sun or at least it's getting enough light and enough protection. That way it maintains its lovely purple colors, as you can see. Given enough time, it tends to trail down, but if you keep them short, they will just tend to they just tend to form clumps in the ground, sprawling with very thick growth. Given the dark colors, this makes it a very ideal choice to partner with other bright colors because it provides a nice bit of contrast and a nice break from all of those greens and other lime colors. Another thing I've been known to use quite often actually is this Initio Serpens. This is a dwarf version of the blue chalk sticks. As you can see right now, they are in bloom. They usually bloom towards, well, after summer. I have to chop them off soon because otherwise it would be attracting a lot of mealybugs. But anyway, they form very nice clumps, very low clumps, and they spread so easily that, you know, just taking a few cuttings and sticking them in the ground is enough to seed another clump. And they are so bright blue, especially given enough sunlight, they can withstand the full sun. They are so bright blue that they make nice contrast against the greens. And if you pair them with similarly blue plants, such as these elegance, then, you know, they are they have different textures but they have similar colors this is more light this is darker you know you can create a gradient and i always use this too in my water or sea themed arrangements now it's time to move on to echeverias now you know me to be an echeveria collector and i know a lot about using echeverias in my designs over the years i have figured out which Echeveras make nice clumps and which are best used in a mass planting arrangement. I've got a bunch of them around of me and let me give you a tour. So the first one that I'd like to show you is this Echeveria elegance. They are otherwise known as the Mexican snowball. They are so named because that's what their shape looks like. They look like a snowball if given enough sunlight. These ones are some of the elegance that I have harvested in the past few weeks as I was doing my landscapes. So yeah. They form these little tiny balls and they offset very prolifically and as you can see, I've got this ground covered, entirely covered with elegance. Another plant that I also like using is this Echeveria set oliver. They are quite dark and they have very thin leaves, which allows it to provide contrast, not just in color, but also in texture. So if you see the transition between 
the set Oliver and the elegance it creates a distinct order and in this case I used it in uh, in this lily pad design with the Kante pretending to be the lotus flower so yeah the next one I'd like to show you is this Echeveria Secunda Gloca. It is usually bluish green, more blue, more blue than green, I think. And they tend to be darker compared to the Elegance. So I often like to transition from Gloca into Elegance. At least that's what I did here in my stream. A lot of people also tend to call this hens and chicks because as you can see, it just clearly grows. If you remember last year when I replanted this in, I just placed in a bunch of heads, a bunch of cuttings and gave them a bit of time and these things all of these offsets just grew in between filling up all of the gaps so yeah this is a really fast grower the next one to show you is this Echeveria Violet Queen right now they are shifting colors because it is getting quite cold here in Melbourne but otherwise normally they are more blue than green and purple in terms of colors they are more somewhere in between the elegance and the Glocka, which is why I also use it to soften the transition going from this color to that color. And then we also have this Echeveria Colorata Mexican Giant. These things, at first they tend to be solitary, but given enough time, once they're mature enough, they just push out a lot of pops. And I found out that they also make great ground cover because given the sheer number of pops that they produce, you could just use them, pick up the pops and plant, replant them in the ground. And they are so white, so in terms of a grade, you have the Glocka all the way down to Violet Queen. Then we have the Elegance and finally we have the Mexican Giant. So we have a gradient from dark to light. Of course, nothing screams Seriscapades more than a bunch of Echeveria Imbricata. So I've got a clump of them down here, some of them in a pot and the rest on the ground. They, there seems to be two varieties here in Australia. We have the the regular type which well these are not it they tend to be larger they are darker and in winter they tend to be more purple than red while these ones these are the paler version so it's like the it's pretty much the same as the rubro tinctum we have the pale version and the regular version so these are the pale version the pale version tends to clump more strongly than the regular version they also tend to be smaller and in winter when they are fully stressed they they are more orange and red than the regular versions and on my left side these are Echeveria cloudburst I'm slowly replacing my Imbricata with cloudburst because I find that the cloudburst in my climate are more resilient against fungus in situations where my Imbricata would rot these ones don't the thing about Imbricata is that they grow really fast they spread really fast but they are also more susceptible to rot compared to the cloudburst although thankfully the cloudburst also grows well it also tends to produce lots of pops but not as much as Embricata, which is why I am slowly, well, I have a bunch of them planted here. There's a few more pops down here and I've got a bunch in other areas. So let me show you. And yeah, I'm slowly phasing out my Embricata, replacing them with a stronger and hardier cloudburst. In terms of colors, on first glance, they tend to look the same, especially in summer. But once, as we get to the colder months, this tend to be lighter and more colorful compared to the Embricata. The Embricata tends to be more cup-like, has rounder leaves, while the cloudbursts are more pointy at the end. Next up are a bunch of Echeveria agavoides hybrids and cultivars. On your left, this is an Echeveria agavoides red edge. This tends to produce lots of offsets once it's mature enough. And over the years, I've gotten a lot of these that I've started using them in my clumping arrangements. On the far right is another Echeveria agavoides cultivar that is an Echeveria agavoides lemaire. And as you can see, it has a lot of pups surrounding the main plant. I haven't separated it yet. And like the red edge, throughout the years, I've gotten a lot of pups from this plant. So I've, I've been using it in various arrangements as well. There are many other Agavoids cultivars. I've only shown you this two and both of them happen to be green. And in between are different hybrids based on Agavoides. So this first one right here, this is the Echeveria benimusume. It is mostly green during the warmer months, but as it gets colder, it gets a very strong red along the leaf margins. And in winter, it gets fully red. And like the Agavoides, it has a sharp leaf apex. Only this tends to be more cup-like, while this tends to be just straight out. And like the Red Edge and Lemaire, I've also gotten lots of pops from my Benimusume throughout the years. And yeah, 
using a 10 clamp arrangement, really good. And finally, we have Echeveria Mira. It tends to be olive green. Sometimes it turns orange and brown, like you can see here, depending on how much stress, how much sunlight you're giving it. In any case, both of these produce a lot of offsets as well. There are many other Agavois hybrids that also clump a lot. Maybe an example I could think of is Echeveria Gilva, Echeveria Gaia, many others, too many to name. I'm just using a subset, a representation, and in this case, this is an Agavoides cultivars and hybrids group. I'm actually planning to create an Agavoides section in my garden. I haven't gotten around to starting on that yet, but yeah, we'll be doing that really soon. And finally, rounding up my roundup are these three plants. This is an Echeveria halbingeri. It is a tiny plant, one of the smallest plants even. I think the Halbingeri, the Minima, and I can't remember what else. I think it was the Vincent Cato are some of the smallest Echeverias you can find. I picked the Halbingeri to represent the small Echeverias. Well, this two actually, but okay. Uh, <laughs> the Halbingeri represents the small Echeverias. They form, well, a lot of the smaller Echeverias form very many clumps. I think another example you can think of is Echeveria prolifica. But the problem with Prolifica is that it is so small that it's hard to spread them and, you know, get a clump going. I find that the Halbingeri is easier to do, easier to work with. So, yeah, I think, I even think this is even more stable, more resistant, more resilient to the elements compared to the Prolifica. I tried Prolifica before, but maybe I did it too soon and they just burnt up during summer. I have some Prolifica in pots and I think now that it's getting colder, I'll try seeding a clump again. So we'll see what happens by springtime next year. And next is this Echeveria subcorimbosa Lau 26. Compared to the Halbingeri, the Halbingeri tends to have a very chiseled structure while the subcorimbosa tends to look powdery and it looks squishy, more button, more cushion-like. So it provides a different type of texture if you have a look at the two. They have very different textures, so mixing and matching might be a good option here. Finally, we have Echeveria Lola. It is a light-colored plant, and as you can see, it produces lots of pops. I haven't broken apart this clump yet, but I will be doing that soon, especially since um, we're heading into winter. So I think it's a good time to get them established on their own roots before it gets too cold, because by then they would not be doing anything. So, Given that it is a light plant, it is nice using the Lola to contrast against the colors of many other plants, and especially since majority of the plants are green and blue. So white contrast against blue, why not? And that was it for my clumping plants roundup. I would love to do more, but it's getting dark and it might be raining soon. So I have to cut it down short. I might do another roundup video of the taller bushy plants that you might want to use as borders or features in your garden. Let me know down in the comments if that's something you would like to see. I hope you enjoyed this video. There are many more plants that would fit the clumping category, but I can only show you so much. Let me know which one is your favorite of the list that I've shown you. And also let me know down in the comments if there are other clumping plants that you like using in your garden. And to get more videos like this, make sure to subscribe to my channel and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.